Hello everybody. The Warriors just held on in an exciting game against the Brooklyn Nets. I wanted to focus on the biggest shot of the night. A very simple play, the Steph Clay pick and pop, which they pretty rarely run because a lot of its effectiveness comes from the surprise factor. But let me give you a few examples. Here's a simple example. Clay throwing up the thumb. Whenever the Warriors set a screen for somebody, they point their thumb behind their shoulder like, hey, come and hitch a ride on my screen. And Clay's coming over here to set a screen on Steph's man. And you've got to think of it from the defender's point of view. What would you do? So probably the first thing you try to do is switch. You'd have Clay's defender come around and meet Steph on the other side of the screen. Robertson goes to Steph. Here's Russell Westbrook. Nobody ever got fired for following Steph Curry. And Russell Westbrook is not the kind of defender who likes to leave his man. So Clay just pops out to open space. Here's Clay setting a screen for Steph again. It looks like he'll take the screen this way. This defender doesn't want to leave Steph. So this defender feels like they have to jump out. Steph has drawn two men. He's literally standing well on the logo. Clay just peels off. Body language theater, it's funny to watch J.R. Smith here. Once he realizes that the two of them are double teaming Steph on the logo, you're gonna see him turn and see that Clay has an open three and he's just gonna throw his hand down in anger. Ah. So often, Clay doesn't even set a proper screen. Here he is getting into screen position. It looks like he's going to do screen-like activities, but then he's going to immediately slip the screen. But that's going to be enough to make this defender feel like they have to pop out, and this defender is going to follow Steph. So when you're just trying to mess up the defense, it doesn't matter that much whether you get hard contact on your screen. The Jazz do something interesting in this coverage. This man figured it out a little too late that Clay was popping out, but he is running over to rotate, and he does end up contesting the shot. If he'd gone earlier, then that would have forced Clay to pass it off to the open man, Harrison Barnes here, and forced this defender to rotate off of Sean Livingston, and so the ball would have had to ping around a bit more, but it's probably better that the ball be ping-ponging around as opposed to Clay Thompson having a semi-open three. So why do two defenders keep on going to Steph? They must know that's not optimal, especially with the second greatest shooter of all time standing 15 feet away. That's what happens when you don't run the play very often. You just run it every few games and certainly not spamming it in the same game. And then the defense doesn't know exactly how to cover it. And usually whoever's guarding Clay and Steph are both used to guarding the ball handler in pick and rolls. So that's why it gets funky when Clay is the one setting the screen. So if defenses could sit back and think about it, probably the proper defense would be to switch the screen cleanly. Although I like this rotation idea from the strong corner. Here's a different Utah game. And in this game, they switch the screen. Here's Clay setting the screen, Steph taking the screen, and this is a hard enough screen that the defender has to call for the switch. So this man will switch over to Steph. That's not bad. That's better than an open Clay Thompson 3. Of course, you still have to deal with the Steph Curry ISO, and that's not always something easy to cover. So here Steph ends up ISOing this guy. It is almost the end of the game. It's a tie game. They tried the play, the pick and pop, and it didn't work, but that's fine. That just gave them a really good percentage chance something good would happen, and now Steph has to pull a shot out of his butt. And he's really good at doing that. Here at the Oklahoma City Thunder try switching. Here Russell Westbrook voluntarily gives up the switch, and Randy Foy comes over to guard Steph. But there is a suspicious amount of space between him and Steph, and so he just hops onto two feet, and Steph immediately attacks on the dribble right as he hops which makes him go into slight panic mode and recover hard back towards his right. And Steph's going to take that as an invitation to just pull up. So even if you decide to switch, it's hard to switch cleanly. And even the ideal situation is just no switch. The Warriors don't run many of these Steph Clay pick and rolls, but a lot of the footage that I have is against the Thunder. And to be honest, I think the Warriors believe Russell Westbrook is a uh, defender who is prone to not being crisp with his defensive switches. 
in unusual situations. So here's Clay coming up, and then he's going to slip the screen immediately. So he, he doesn't even get close enough to plausibly say he's screening. But there's something about the way Clay is passing by. I don't know if there's just a slipstream or something, but it definitely hypnotizes Russ into staying right here and keeping his arms down. Steph can just pull up in his face while Clay whizzes by with the distraction. Maybe Clay was singing a very haunting tune or something like that. I don't know, but something distracted Russ and lulled him into a sense of false security. Bang. Okay, so let's come back to the Brooklyn game. I don't think the Warriors have run this Steph Clay pick and roll this game, and I'm not even sure they've run it since Clay's come back question mark. This is a pretty ideal situation to try the Steph Clay pick and roll because Patty Mills, you can't see him because he's eclipsed by Clay right now, but Patty Mills is one of the defenders in the action and the next help guy is Kyrie Irving. So you couldn't ask for a better setup than this because let's reflect on the different defenses we've seen. There's the defense of sending two men at Steph, which is going to give Clay an open shot. So the Warriors are fine with that option. Then there could be no switch. And then that means Clay will be guarded with Patty Mills running to catch up with Clay. And Clay is taller than Mills, so he'll just fire over the top. So no problem there. Or there'll be a clean switch, which means that Steph will now be guarded by Patty Mills and not this Kessler Edwards guy, who seems to be a pretty good defender. I like this guy. So you definitely want to take your chances with Patty Mills. Patty Mills does try hard on defense. He's a smart player, but he's also 6'1". So basically, there's no bad outcomes in this particular situation. Oh, and even if the Nets decide to rotate help, because you imagine that Clay's going to set the screen and then slip, and so it's possible that the next man will rotate over, but it's going to be Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving is one of the great difficult shot makers of all time. He's also 6'2 and not really a fearsome defender. So yeah, you'll take your chances with that. So anyway, this is a good situation for the Warriors to run this play. Clay setting the screen. Clay is not really very convincing that he's setting a screen. He's just slightly changing the gravitational field around the defender and then he's just out of there. But it's enough to make the Nets defense mess up because it looks like Steph's going to take this screen. Patty Mills is going to rotate to Steph. Kessler Edwards is going to stay with Steph because no one ever got fired for staying with Steph. So for a split second, Brooklyn goes with the send two men at Steph option. I don't know that they planned that. It's just what happened. So Patty Mills took one fateful step to switch to Steph. Edward stays with Steph. Clay's now free as a bird, but there is Kyrie Irving over here who can rotate to challenge the shot. But as I've said, Kyrie Irving is not known as a shot blocker. He's only just going to take a step towards Clay because let's say that Kyrie completely made Clay divert the shot. Kyrie left Andrew Wiggins alone on the corner there, so Clay's just going to pass it to Wiggins. So Kyrie is trying to stunt at somebody and then recover to his man. Here's poor Patty Mills trailing the play. Bang. Everyone is going nuts. Steph is trying out the Juan Toscano Anderson approved I'm staying totally still looking at you with adoring eyes celebration. There he is. Still there. This angle gives you a sense of how much space this action creates for Clay. Here's Clay coming to set the pseudo screen and then slip. Patty Mills, just one step in this direction. Edwards following Steph, but this creates a lot of space. And there's Kyrie stunting. There's Mills trying to catch up desperately. There's Andrew Wiggins as the third option, completely alone on the corner there. Pure. Even though the Splash Brothers shot pretty badly tonight, when it counted, they made the shots. I think Steph and Clay combined for the last 17 points for the Warriors. I guess I should say something about what happened after that awesome shot. First Kyrie hit a incredibly high difficulty three to bring it back within a one point game, but it still seems like the Warriors mostly have this in the bag because uh, you have one point game, Brooklyn has to foul on the catch, hopefully Steph or Clay makes two free throws, now you're up three, and then hopefully you took some notes from that stupid Indiana game where, you, where they lost the game because they didn't foul when they were up three. So hopefully the Warriors would have learned by then. So this game should be a lock, but the referees made it a real lock 
when they called this foul before the inbounds, which gave the Warriors a free throw and then the ball again, which basically, if you make all your free throws, it, it becomes impossible to catch up. And I guess there's some controversy in some circles because people felt, hey, that wasn't a foul. Kyrie himself is going to be twirling his finger saying, hey, review this thing. All right, so we'll just take one look at the replay here. Clay's going to cut across. Steph is going to set a screen on Clay's defender. Kyrie has to switch on to Clay. Kyrie's going to run into Clay with his chest and also put his arm across Clay. So there's definitely a pretty significant bump there. And here, while Kyrie is holding Clay, I think Kyrie's pretty clearly putting his arm to block Clay's cut. And then I think this is unintentional, but then Kyrie's feet is going to get in the way of Clay's foot and he's just going to trip over this thing. And then for everybody who's claiming that Coach Steve Nash is an idiot for not challenging this, Steve Nash said afterwards that the referees did view this on video because they were trying to decide whether that bump happened before Otto Porter released the ball. So the refs had plenty of time to look at the video, and so one of them went over to Steve Nash and said, don't try to challenge us because we're going to definitely call this a foul. So that's why Steve Nash didn't challenge, and uh, it was a foul. So, so despite what Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson and angry people on Twitter said, there's no point in Steve Nash challenging. Oh yeah, afterwards Kyrie also said it was a foul. I can't help talking about one of my favorite micro moments from the broadcast. Mark Jackson was talking about how Andre Iguodala is always dispensing wisdom to people on the bench, which is true. And then the camera flashes over to this apparent wisdom dispensing session. And of course, my first question is, what is up with this outfit, Andre? How many Bengal Tigers had to die for this outfit? But even ignoring that, Jordan Poole and Andrea Guadalla are having some intense conversation. And it looks like they're talking about something happening on the court. You figure, oh, they're dissecting some kind of X's and O's or something like that. But then you see Jordan Poole do this. <laughs> I cannot begin to construct a scenario where you would make that face about a basketball situation, but maybe you're more creative than I am. 